Sí. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 Mario Urbina Gomez. Mario Urbina Gomez. And sir, I'm going to ask you to speak loudly and clearly into that microphone so everybody can hear you, okay? Cerca del micrófono para que todo el mundo le pueda escuchar, okay? David. That's fine. Okay. Um, Mr. Gomez, um, are you familiar with the house that's located at, at 165 Montesino Drive, located here in Wake County? Sí. Yes. Um, how do you know about that house? ¿Y cómo sabe esta casa? Soy el propietario de la vivienda. I am the owner of this home. Were you the owner of this home back in January of 2013? En enero de esta casa en el 2013. Sí. Yes. Um, were you living in that residence back in January of 2013? Sí. Yes. Who was living in that residence with you? Este, un familiar. A family member? Okay. Um, so was it just the two of you all? Eran solamente los dos de ustedes. Sí. Yes. Okay. Did you rent out any uh, portion of that house um, to other people? No. No. Okay. Uh, do you know um, um, Israel Vasquez? Sí. Yes. How do you know him? Yo lo conocí por medio de su hermana, que su hermano me pidió que yo le rentara a su mamá. I met him through his sister. His sister asked me uh, through her to be able to rent to him. Okay. Por, to, to his mother, cor uh, interpreter correct. Can I continue? Yes. Sí. Por eso conocí a... Vázquez. That's how I met Vázquez. Yo no lo conocía a ellos. I didn't know them. Por, su, por medio de su hermana que me pidió que le rentara la propiedad. Through their sister, through, uh, in order for me to be able to rent the property. Did you rent them the property? ¿Les arrendó la propiedad? Mm, sí. Yes. Okay. Uh, and was this back in January of 2013? Sí. Yes. So at that time, in January of 2013, how many people total are in the house? Cinco. Five. Um, How long um, have you owned that house at um, 165 Montesino Drive? Hey, es propietario usted de esta casa de 165 Montesino Drive. 13 años. 13 years. And how long um, have you rented space to Mr. Vasquez and, and, and his family? Y a su familia. Siete años. Seven years. Is that up to this point, to this day now? Esto continúa hasta esta fecha. Sí. Yes. Una pregunta. One question. Yes, sir. Sí, señor. Cada mes le estoy pidiendo la propiedad y no quieren desalojar. Every month I am asking for the property back, but they do not want to leave. Okay. Well, that's going to be something we'll, okay. we'll, you know, that will come up later. Para que eventualmente va a surgir. At the time back in January of 2013, how long had they been living in that residence with you? Back then? Yes, sir. Sí, señor. Cinco años. Five years. Okay. Do you know how to get to the attic space in your house? ¿Usted sabe cómo acceder al ático de su casa? Sí. Yes. How do you do that? ¿Cómo lo hace? Solamente las personas que están rentando la recámara, que son tres personas, solamente ellos pueden usar el ático. Uh, only the people who are renting the room, who are three of them, they are able to use the attic. 
Why is that? ¿Y cómo así? ¿Cómo es esto? Porque está dentro de la recámara y nada más tienen ellos acceso a poder tomar el ático. Because it is located within the room and only them have access to the attic. Okay, so they're the ones who are renting the room where the attic access is? Donde tienen acceso al ático. Correcto. That's correct. Um, prior to uh, uh, that family moving in, did you use your attic space for any kind of storage or any other purpose? No. No. Had you ever gone up into your attic space before that family moved in? No. No. Do you own any firearms? ¿Es dueño de algún arma de fuego? No. No. In the 13 years that you have owned that house, have you brought, whether you owned them or not, have you brought any firearms into your house? No. No. Uh, do you own any other kind of equipment that you use in your house? No. No. that were found in your house back in January of 2013? Interpreter needs repetition, please. Did you find out about weapon, firearms, guns being found in your house back in January of 2013? No. No. Were you present when the search warrants were executed at your house back in January of 2013? Sí. Yes. Did you find out either while you were there to see or from the officers later that guns were found in there? O por los oficiales que se encontraron armas allí? No. Posteriormente yo supe cuando me trajeron aquí a en a detener. No, I found afterwards when I was brought over here at the detention. Cuando cuando llegaron yo dije, "Wow, ¿qué pasó?" When me, me, yo estaba descansando, me dijeron, ¿Qué, qué, ¿qué pasó? When they came, I said, what? What happened? They came in, I was resting, I said, what's going on? Nunca había tenido este problema. I had never had this issue. Aquí, de mis 51 años que tengo, nunca había tenido problema. 15 years old, I've never had this type no, of issue. No, nada, yo no sé por qué. None of that. O sea, me dio, why. me dio mucho miedo, tengo mucho miedo yo so, al respecto. So I was very scared, I'm, I'm still very scared in, in regard to all of this. Y a este momento tengo demasiado miedo con la familia. And up until this second, I am really scared about the family. No sé qué, no, no sé. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Did you, uh, in January of 2013, were you aware of any guns that were in your house? en su casa? Oh. No. And to this day, have you brought any guns into your house? No. No. The room where the attic access is, do you know who was specifically staying in that room? Yes. Who was staying in that room? Teodora Vázquez. Teodora Vázquez. Este, Andrés Vázquez. Andrés Vázquez. Israel Vázquez. Israel Vázquez. Eh, no recuerdo el otro nombre. Este. I don't remember the other name. Eh, Was it another male or another female? Otro hombre, otra mujer. Hombre, hermano de ellos. Uh, male, it was uh, one of their brothers. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Gomez. Good morning. I just want to be clear. You named uh, four people, is that correct, that were staying in that room? Yes. What was the first person? ¿Cuál fue la primera persona? Name? El nombre? Teodora Vázquez. Teodora Vázquez. Is that a male or female? Es hombre o mujer. Mujer. Me, uh, female. And 
the second person you named was that what's that name again Israel Vasquez Israel Vasquez okay and then I believe you said Andres Vasquez si yes is that a, a male este es un hombre si yes about how old Andres Andres yes si Unos 24, 25, no recuerdo. Maybe 24, 25, I, I don't remember. Was that a brother Era to Israel Vasquez? Israel Vasquez? Yeah, sí. Uh, yes, yes. And then the uh, fourth male, y el cuarto hombre. did you, is that the one, este, do you remember the name of este, that male? ¿Se acuerda el nombre de, de, este, de este hombre? No me acuerdo. I don't eh, remember. Was it Elias? Elias, sí, sí. No, otro otro nombre. Elias es su hermano. Elias, yes, no, no, the, the different name. That's his brother. Eh, That's okay. whose brother? Es el hermano de quién? De Santillán, de 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 este de. Of Santillán. No, no, no. Um, de, de, no. Es hermano de Andrés. It's uh, Andrés' uh, brother. Brother. Right. So, it's in Israel. Is that Israel's brother as well? Hermano de Israel también. Sí. Yes. Es Manuel el que se está quedando en el cuarto de las cuatro personas. Is Manuel the one who's staying in the room where the four people are? Um, can you repeat that? ¿Será que puede repetir eso, por favor? Manuel. Manuel, el que se queda en el cuarto, Manuel, de las cuatro personas. The one who stays in the room of the four people. Manuel is the Manuel es el, third es male? El, el tercer hombre. Sí. Yes. And how old is Manuel? ¿Cuántos años tiene Manuel? Or how old was Manuel if, años tiene when he lived there? Cuando vivió allí. No, no, no sé cuántos años tiene. Uh, no, I don't know how old he is. Approximately? Approximately. Mm, 18. 18. And do you know how approximately how old Israel was uh, when he lived there? Tenía Israel cuando vivía allí. 13. 13, 4, 13. No, 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 no recuerdo. I don't remember. And, and you were the only other person living in the house? Sí. Yes. Your Honor, may the interpreter instruct the witness to look at the attorneys and not at the interpreter, please. Amen. Señor, por favor, voltea a ver a los abogados y no intérprete. Sí. Voltea a ver a los abogados, por favor. Amen. Gracias. Sí. Mr. Cutler, whenever you're ready. Señor Cutler, cuando esté listo. Sí. After the... So... What, hap had, how, what happened when uh, the police came to search your residence? Entonces, ¿qué es lo que sucedió cuando la policía llegó para registrar su vivienda? Que, que todos nos, este, nos fuéramos al suelo y que iban a, a hacer una revisión de, de la propiedad. We all laid on the ground because they were going to search the property. How did you find out they were there? ¿Y cómo se enteró usted que ellos estaban ahí? Porque yo ese día yo estaba descansando. Because that day I was off. But when did you first see the police? ¿Y cuándo fue la primera vez que usted vio a la policía? Ese mismo día. That same day. And tell me what happened. How did they get into your house? Y dígame qué sucedió. ¿Cómo entraron ellos a su casa? Tocaron la puerta. No la abrieron. They knocked on the door. They didn't open. Posteriormente, le dieron un golpe y le romp se rompió la puerta. After that, they hit the door and the door broke. Mm, por no querer abrir el, la puerta principal. Because they didn't want to open the main door. Y a todos nos, a todos nos dijeron que, 
que nos fuéramos al suelo, que era una orden de revisión de la propiedad. And they told all of us to lay on the ground because they had a search warrant. Yo, yo sin saber qué es lo que estaba pasando al respecto. And since I did not know what was happening. Yo me asusté demasiado. I got really scared. After, uh, after they did the search and everyone was brought down to investigations, correct? Or to the police department? Y después de que hicieron el cateo, a todos los llevaron a la jefatura de la policía? Sí. Yes. Did you, uh, did you go back to the, re when did you go back to the residence? Y cuando regresó usted a su residencia? 15, 15 de marzo. March 15. Did anyone live in the residence after January 15th? ¿Alguien vivía en la residencia después del 15 de enero? Sí. sí. Who was in the residence? Laura, the, the interpreter needs to request a repetition from the attorney. Is that okay? You I'm sorry, did, did you say March or January? I'm not sure, but would, I meant... Would you repeat the question sure. for the interpreter, please? Did anyone... Uh, go back to the house or live in the house after the search warrant was executed después, on January 15th. Después del 15 de enero, alguien regresó a la casa después de que se llevó a cabo, a cabo la orden de cateo de la casa? No. No. Were you the next person to go back to the house as far as you know after the search warrant was executed on the 15th? Que usted sepa, después de que se llevó a cabo la orden de cateo el 15, ¿usted fue la próxima persona que regresó a esa casa? Regresó la familia y yo, y yo regresé el 15 de marzo a la casa. The family returned and then I returned to the house March 15th. Why did you not go back after January 15th? ¿Y por qué no regresó usted ahí después del 15 de enero? Porque a mí me tenían detenido. Este, hasta que se aclarara las, los, el problema. Because I was detained until the problem was cleared up. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Gracias. Esas son todas las preguntas. Sir, um, were you initially charged with some stuff that was found inside of your house from January the 15th, 2013? I'm sorry, Your Honor, the interpreter needs to request another repetition. Sure. Sure. Would you repeat that question one more time? Were you charged um, with some offenses based on the things that were found in your home on January the 15th, 2013? Usted fue imputado con algún cargo o algún delito por alguna de las cosas que se hallaron dentro de su casa en enero del 2013? Sí. Yes. And were those charges um, eventually dismissed in court? Y finalmente esos cargos fueron retirados ante el juez. Sí. Yes. And did you have any connection um, with any of those items that were found in your house back on January the 15th, 2013? ¿Y usted tuvo algún tipo de conexión con los artículos que se encontraron en su casa el 15 de enero del 2013? No. No. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll have anything else, Your Honor. Any really cross, Mr. Collar? Just briefly. Uh, were you aware they found uh, marijuana in your home on the 15th of January? ¿Estaba usted al tanto que hallaron marihuana en enero 15 dentro de su casa? Yo estuve al tanto cuando me trajeron aquí en la noche. I was aware when they brought me that night here. Ahí me di cuenta yo. That's when I found out. But you were aware that the residents of your house that you've described smoked marijuana, correct? Usted estaba enterado que la residencia de su casa ahí fumaba marihuana, correcto? Yeah. Yeah. And you told the police that you knew that they smoked marijuana in the residence, correct? Y usted le dijo a la policía que usted sabía que adentro de esa residencia fumaban marihuana, correcto? No precisamente adentro, fumaban afuera en la, en la, 
en el parquedero afuera. No precisamente inside, pero they would smoke outside, like in the parking lot area of the house. All right, no thank you. I have a question. Una pregunta. I have a question. Yes, sir. I mean, I, I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Yo ya no tengo ninguna pregunta, señoría. Thank you, sir. You can step down. Gracias, señor. Ya se puede bajar. Members of the jury, it's about eight minutes till eleven. This is a good time for us to take our morning break. I'm going to release you until eleven ten. Please keep in mind the rules. Don't talk about this case among yourselves or allow anybody to talk about it in your presence. Don't form any opinions about anything that you've heard and don't conduct any research or investigation. I'm going to ask you to return to the jury room at 11.10 and we'll resume at that time. I'm going to ask everyone else to please remain seated while the jury is excused. <coughs> Excuse me, let the record reflect that all members of the jury have left the courtroom. Anything from the state? Yes, sir. Or the defense? No, Your Honor. And your next witness is the CCBI agent. She's here. She's here. Very well. Uh, we'll be at recess till 10 after 11. Your Honor, may the interpreters be excused for the day? Yes, I don't think that we're going to need y'all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and well, I believe that'll be it for this trial. I don't think we have any other witnesses where they'll be needed. Thank you. Superior Court stands at recess till 11 10. You've seen the still photos. We're going to start with the video, okay. then we have the 360 camera, and then we'll go to those photos. No. No. Because we're not plugged in. As well as Shamble for the state. Uh, Mr. Cutler, are there any matters you want to address before we proceed? Yeah. I would, I would object to uh, the cumulative nature of what I believe the state tends to present as far as these graphic, graphic pictures of the crime scene. I understand um, and have seen the 125 odd photos that the state I think intends to offer. 
112 or, is what I got. I'm but. sorry, 112. I apologize. Um, and I think those are sufficient. They show prior to, um, more than sufficient, to show the, how the scene appeared um, prior to the evidence text coming in and then after with the, with the evidence markers. Um, I don't think a, a video of that same, essentially the same photographs is necessary. I think it would be, it's cumulative and I would object to uh, both being presented when essentially, as I understand it, the pictures portray, and, there, and there's other pictures that I think in state, the state intends to offer as well that are 360 photos um, that'll be another uh, additional photos of the victims in the scene. Um, I, I would ask the court to consider allowing the pictures. I think the pictures are more than sufficient uh, to document and the scene. And, and the issue in this case, obviously, you know, the graphic nature of the scene is that's not an element in this case. It's been talked about by witnesses, by detectives, and they're going to see the scene and there is no need to play uh, an hour's long or, or 30 minutes of video and then 112 pictures and then there's more pictures as well, I guess, if, if that's not counting the 360 photos that the state intends to offer. So I would ask the court uh, to limit the state to the, to the photographs and, and as they are more than sufficient uh, to document the scene and that the officers found and that the, it would be, it's going to be, the video would be du duplicative of this same type of evidence that is really not relevant. It's rel the nature of the crime scene is obviously relevant in what happened, but there's no need to double up with a video and still photos. And I'd, so I'd object and ask the court to consider um, not allowing the state to, to, to present that duplicative evidence. Mr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Sachs. Your Honor, we would object. We would certainly say that the um, or to object to his motion and argue that um, those additional things are entirely necessary. Um, I have personally learned um, in some of these cases that um, that kind of those kind of photographs and the videos and the three six all those things are necessary because what's going to happen is at the end the jury is going to come back with some kind of question or they're going to be arguing about some point that we're not thinking about. And if it's not covered in the angle that that still photo, you know, catches, everybody starts guessing about what, what was in there. Um, I, I have learned, especially in these big cases, that the video and these 360 cameras now capture more um, of, of, of the scene. And, and they, can, they can get it. They get more of the, the context of the scene from these things. And when they start arguing about, like, a distance or what was behind the person, you, you know, when, when, when this happened, trying to piece the photographs together sometimes doesn't work. The 360 cameras and the videos are very good for that, mainly for the jury. And um, uh, again, I think it's very necessary evidence. We have the burden of proof on this thing. We have to prove this to the jury. Um, as I told the court beforehand, before we ever started, um, this is not everything that we have. We had over 1,600 photos <laughs> um, altogether of this scene. And I have whittled that down to 112. Um, so, I mean, I, we could put in, and, and I have clearly, clearly not put in the most gruesome photographs of these victims and of the scene that, that we have in, in our possession. Um, I, have been, I have been as sensitive as I can to, to this issue to, to try and make this balance about showing what I need to show to, to make my arguments and make, and make the, um, uh, the proof, uh, to present the proof that I think is necessary to prove this case, but also understanding that we're not trying to inflame passions. The bottom line is this is a double homicide. You know, the emotion's going to be involved. We talked about it in jury selection. We talked about it before we even brought the jury in, that there were going to be these graphic photographs, you know, involved in this case. Well, we're now at that point, and I've tried to, as best I can, sanitize it as, as best I can. Um, but I do believe that not only the photographs, but the 360 cameras, which aren't all of the victim, the 360 cameras placed in different positions. Like, there's one that's outside to see you know, how it looks all around outside. So they'll be able to see Colonial Drive, they'll see down, be able to see down the street to see where, towards where Old Stage Road goes, you know, and, and the driveway and stuff. There is one in the living room, there is one in the kitchen, there is one in the hallway you know, that, that goes around. So not every panoramic is going to have the victims, but some will. 
Um, that's just the nature of, of the offense, the nature of this scene. And, but I do believe that this evidence is absolutely necessary because <clears throat> I, I have learned they're going to come back with a question. They're going to be arguing about some point. And if they want to see something, the video and the 360 cameras are vital to kind of maybe show something that they didn't see from, from the angle on a still photograph. So we would argue that it's entirely admissible. I would strongly disagree with Mr. Sachs on the issue of the jury is going to get caught up with some issue as to what happened. This is not a case where there's some question of what happened in this house or whether it was uh, self-defense or whether there was some, I mean, there's, this is not that kind of case. And uh, I dare say they will not be tied up in the details of what happened in that house. Um, the evidence has been clear and it's not been contradicted as to what happened and will not be contradicted as to what happened in there. The question here is who committed the crime. But certainly what happened in that house, I would suggest that we do not need to double and triple up on pictures of victims and uh, and, and, and the carnage that was left in there to, to prove what happened. And that's where the video does not, you know, again, that's doubling up. I, I'm not objecting to the panoramic photos. I'm not objecting to the photos uh, of those 112. I think they are more than sufficient to document the crime scene. And so I would ask you to consider not allowing the, the video this point. In my discretion, I'm going to deny the defendant's request, and I'll just state that I have reviewed requests to limit the presentation of the evidence at this point. I have reviewed the 112 photographs that have been at least forecast. That's what the jury is going to uh, see through the, the next witness or two. Um, those still photographs. Um, do not, they're not duplicative, they don't overdo what the state is asking. There is a lot of evidence depicted in these photographs and a lot of, so there's a, there's a sheer volume of photographs based on the nature of the crime. The, the uh, video as well as the 360 camera um, will put the court as well as the jury in a better position to appreciate the relationship and the, the spatial relationships between um, the victims, where they were in the scene, uh, the scene as a whole, the, there's been a lot of testimony about the cars driving up and back and forth as well as uh, various witnesses testifying what they could see or not see uh, from their vantage points and I believe that all of this is relevant for that purpose. And also I, I'll just note and I, I think a factor that that I've considered is that the sheer volume, magnitude, and carnage, I think is the word that you all have used, I think is relevant. The state in this case um, is likely going to ask the court, at least I suspect it's going to ask the court to instruct this jury, um, if we get to that point, on malice, premeditation, and deliberation, and the, the evidence depicted in these photographs is relevant to that. Um, I'm going to ask the state to be mindful um, of the sensibilities of the jurors. I will monitor the sensibilities of the jurors um, and see if it um, gets to the point of offensive. But I've, I view these and these photographs are, um, are horrible, but they do not depict um, things that are um, improper for the jury to consider. Um, I also want to note for the record that these photographs are going to be played on a television monitor as opposed to the large overhead screen. Uh, the television monitor appears to be, I'm terrible, I don't know, 35 to 40 inch uh, yeah. diagonal TV screen. Um, and um, it's not being played in direct proximity to where the defendant is currently seated. Um, was there anything else at this point, Mr. Sachs? Yes, sir. Or Mr. Cullen? Just for the record, Your Honor, I would, uh, my objection would be based on 
violation of due process pursuant to the fifth and fourteenth amendments of of the, uh, your objections the constitution today. and so i just put your constitutionalize did, that your objection is noted for the record and overruled and i will also state um that i'm also considering the probative value of these photographs individually and collectively as well as the video in the 360 uh the probative value outweighs the prejudicial effect of the defendant um, to deprive the state of showing these to the jury, I believe, deprives them of the ability to uh, offer to the jury a full explanation and appreciation as to what the scene looked like in the early morning hours of January the 5th. Uh, if you will bring in the jury, please. And I'm going to leave it to you as well. Just schedule wise, what, I, what I've done is, is we've talked, and especially since we're even now getting a little later start, the way I see this going, it's going to take you know, a few minutes to do some preliminary questioning and, and, and stuff with our agent um, and, and her work at the scene and what they do and that kind of stuff. Um, I was then going to start with the video, which is 25 minutes, and then from there go to the 360 camera. I suspect, I suspect that's about how far I'll get and I'll be close to one. So I, I, I asked the investigator Barefoot to kind of give me a, because I'm going to be just plowing ahead. Before I start the photos, I'm probably going to check the time, because once we start the photos, you see there are 112 of them. I doubt, seriously, I'd be able to get through all of them. I doubt it. What I'm going to do is, and that's what I was getting ready to ask you, is I'm going to leave it to you to okay. to find a breaking point, and if it, we'll, we'll just monitor it. That, that would be, as I can see, a forecast would probably be where I'll, I'll be looking to break, is between panoramics and the still photos. Okay. All right. Um, very well then. We'll bring the Members of the jury, I see everybody present. Uh, we're now ready to proceed. Mr. Sachs, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, say we call Shane Smithy to the stand. Madam Court, please place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Would you please introduce yourself to this jury and tell them who you are and what you do for a living? I'm Shane Smithy, and I'm a crime scene agent with the City County Bureau of Identification. Is that what is commonly known as CCBI? Yes, sir. And what does CCBI do? My particular unit within CCBI, we're responsible for responding to any and all crime scenes within Wake County. Uh, we document the scene, collect any kind of physical or latent evidence that's present, and then we um, document our findings in a written report. Is that basically operating as a crime scene technician? Yes, sir. And how long have you been with CCBI? A little over 14 years. Um, and uh, over those 14 years, have you had the occasion to, to um, process or work on crime scenes involving homicides? Yes, sir. And have you testified in, in uh, court before regarding your, those findings and the documentation of those crime scenes? Yes, sir. And is that part of your duties and, and your job um, after doing uh, uh, the crime scene work is to come into court later and, and explain your findings? Yes, sir. Uh, were you so employed and on duty back on in the early morning hours of, of January the 5th of, of 2013? I was. 
Did you have the occasion during that shift to respond to a, a call for assistance at 708 Colonial Drive? Yes. What was the nature of that call for your assistance? I was told at that time that it was a homicide investigation. Okay. Um, before we get into what you actually did and saw in this particular um, case, would you explain to the jury when you respond to any crime scene, but especially a homicide scene, what do you do? How do you actually process that scene? Normally, when we get dispatched to a scene such as this, when we very first get there, we, we locate somebody, whether it's a detective or an officer um, or a witness or victim, who can give us any kind of information about what's gone on. Um, once we have that information, we can do an initial walkthrough of the scene. We can walk through and look for any potential evidence uh, that may be present, look for areas that may, we may want to focus on when we do our processing. Um, we pretty much just gather any and all information that we can when we first get there so we know what kind of game plan we need to get together as far as processing the scene. And then after that walkthrough, what do you all do? Once we walk through and, and know what kind of processing we want to do, the very first thing we do is we want to document the scene as it is prior to any evidence being moved or any kind of alterations made to the scene. And how do you do that documentation? Normally we photograph each scene. Um, a scene this complex, not only do we photograph the scene, but we'll also take a video of the scene. Um, and we also use what's called a 360 camera, which is basically a, a, a point and shoot camera that we use alongside with a um, specialized tripod that allows us to take a, a series of photographs um, of the scene in various points throughout the scene. Um, once we have all those photographs, we can then turn those over to our forensic photographer who will then map each of the photographs together to create an image that you can then manually navigate through. Um, you can look left, right, up, down, zoom in and out. So it's just another tool to help us document the scene along with video and photographs. Besides um, photographic um, evidence, do you do anything else to document um, a crime scene? Sometimes uh, we also sketch portions of the scene. And when you do the sketches, that also includes sometimes some measurements that you may take? Yes, sir. All right. After um, documenting um, a crime scene, what do you usually do um, as far as the, the scene process? Depending on the scene, um, we will take the measurements, like I said earlier, for the sketch. Um, we collect any evidence that's present. We look for latent evidence or fingerprint evidence throughout the scene. Um, once we collect all the evidence, we do a final walkthrough of the scene to make sure that, that nothing was missed. And is that um, the basic procedure, if not the exact procedure, that you all followed with this particular crime scene at 708 Colonial Drive? Yes, sir. And um, in responding to this um, crime scene at 708 Colonial Drive, were you the only um, agent from CCBI to, to respond to that location? No, sir. Okay. Um, how many agents um, came to that scene altogether, if you recall? I believe to that particular scene, um, four or five throughout different times. And is that mainly just because of the volume of the work that needs to be done? Well, the when I first got there, it was very early in the morning on January 5th, so somebody from night shift was already there. Um, Seeing as how the scene was extremely complex, it was something that we would handle on day shift since it was going to be a long time um, in processing the scene. So there was some, already somebody there from night shift. Um, myself and a supervisor at the time handled the initial scene processing at the time. Um, there were other agents that were involved later in the day at that scene and then uh, supplemental scenes for this case also. When you responded then to this scene at, at 708 um, Colonial Drive on, in, in the early morning hours of January the 5th, 2013, would you just, just briefly explain to the jury what, what you saw when, when you arrived on the scene? When I initially arrived, it was still dark outside. There were numerous deputies on scene, um, investigators, uh, another CCBI supervisor. Um, several people were there. Um, outside the house. Did you start that process that you talked about with trying to gather information from those people as to what had happened? I did. Okay. After getting that information, did you conduct your walkthrough um, that you talked about was the next thing I think you did in processing the scene? Yes, I did. When you did your walkthrough, what did you know? 
I noted that outside the front door on the front stoop area there were two shell casings. Um, walking in through the front door into the living room area there were numerous shell casings on the living room floor. I noticed a male victim on the couch. Um, walking in through the front door you can see into the kitchen area and there was a female decedent on the kitchen floor directly in from the front door. Um, numerous shell casings throughout the residence. Um, after conducting um, uh, walk through them, and, um, I think you said the next step that you all do is, is trying to document the scene, is that correct? Correct. And you had indicated that that entails the use of photography and, and um, video, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, do you recall, um, were you the one who was taking the pictures of this particular scene? I was. Okay. How about the video? Were you the one that took the video of this particular scene? No, sir. All right. Do you know who that was, just if you know? It was Tammy Malinowski. Okay. Was that just another one of the agents who was out there with you at the time? She was the supervisor on scene at the time. Okay. Um, with respect to the, um, uh, the video, had, did you have a chance to see that video um, that, that was taken of that scene uh, before coming to court? I have. Okay. Does that video fairly and accurately depict um, the scene that you recall being at in the early morning hours of, of January the 5th of 2013? Yes, it does. Um, Can I make a Yes, you may. <clears throat> it's going to be 15. Okay. Ma'am, let me show you what's been marked by identification now. It's State's Exhibit number 15. Do you see that red sticker with the 15 on it? I do. I'll just ask you to look at that for a moment and see if you can tell us what that is. This is a DVD, um, appears to be a DVD of the, the scene itself at 708 Colonial Drive. Do you recognize the um, kind of the sleeve that that DVD is in? I do. Uh, where does that sleeve come from? Our forensic photographer creates these. Um, I recognize this as her handwriting and our name, City County Bureau of Identification, and our badge on the front of the sleeve. Uh, does that appear to be the, um, uh, the video that, that your agency provided to us um, for, for use in this particular case? Yes, it is. And again, um, have you had a chance to review this video before coming to court today? Yes, I have. Does it fairly and accurately depict that scene that you were out on, on Colonial Drive back in January of 2013? Yes, it does. From what you recall seeing in the video, was anything added or changed or deleted or anything from um, what you recall seeing out there at that time? No. Your, I, I then move to introduce state exhibit number 15 into evidence. Any objections? Just based on, object based on previous grounds. Is no, the previous objections are noted for record. I will not, in my discretion, I'm going to admit state 15. Uh, your Honor, this time I'd move to, to publish this to the jury and allow them to, to, to see this, this exhibit. But let me ask, are, do you intend to have her narrate it or are we just going to play it through I'm, unnarrated? I'll ask her a few things as it goes by just to set the jury's oriented as to where they are. Okay. Does it have a time stamp so that if we need to make references as to what part of the exhibit you're talking about, you can say we're at time stamp 1527 or whatever? I think it. I think it does. Not not as it runs, but I think on the lower software program. I think it does. We're mindful of that. And um, members of the jury, let me explain to you the process or the manner in which we're going to proceed uh, with this particular exhibit. In my discretion, I'm going to allow states 15 to be published to the jury, and um, a couple of things are going to happen. First, the parties, including me, uh, will move around so that we can get a better vantage point and view it uh, as you see it. Um, once this starts, uh, we have, based on prior experience and also this morning, we have um, played with the, the monitor um, and its placement. Um, but once this starts, and you, it, the backdrop is up now, um, can you see it? And usually it's the folks in the corners that typically have an issue, but can, can you all see it with relative ease? Okay. Uh, will there be sound with this? No, yes, sir. Okay. Um, so we don't need to be concerned about that. So what I, I'm going to dim the lights also uh, so that... may help you all see um, this better, but uh, Mr. 
Cutler, feel free to please move about so that you can see um, this as well. If I could, just for the record, I would object to publication, I guess, is, is okay. also what I would do. Your objections noted for the record and overruled. Now, Ms. Smith, a couple of things. First of all, can you see the monitor from where you are? I can. Okay, and if you feel the need to get to a different place so that you can see it, please do so. If you need to stand up next to it, let me know. We can stop it and let you get up there. Okay. okay. I'm going to ask, um, as we go through some of this stuff, just let me know where we are so that you can explain to the jury, you know, which room we're in or, or things of that nature, okay? Okay. I will remind you, as long as you're on the stand, you should be fine, but make sure to keep your voice up because the court reporter does have to get everything, even if you do step down. Okay. This is the standing in the front yard of 708 Colonial Drive, looking at the front door. And a note at the time of the video here, it's actually daylight, is that correct? Correct. Those yellow markers that have the numbers on them, were they there when you first arrived at the scene? No, they were not. Who places those there? Uh, I place them there. Um, once photographs are taken of the scene, as it is when we arrive, we locate evidence, and prior to doing the video in the 360 camera, we'll place evidence placards down by each piece of evidence that we find. So those will not be in the photographs, but they will be in this video and the 360 camera photos. And what were you trying to note with those placards there on the floor? Those, I believe, a majority of those were shell casings or unfired rounds outside the front door and in the living room. Is that our first victim on the couch now, Jose? Correct, the male victim. I believe here that was sh she was showing the uh, damage to the front door. The interior door frame has been ripped off, and it's it was found on the couch just inside the front door. That's what you're seeing in the video now. Is that right? Correct. That piece right there is the interior door frame that was ripped off. Now. Yes, sir. A female victim.
you still standing in the living room at this point where the video is being taken? Correct. In the living room at this point, the front door would be to my back. Um, the male victim is there on the right. Now we've come all the way full circle, so now we can see the front door. Right? Correct. What about this angle? Where, where are we at? The front door would be to your right there, and this is looking inside, inside the living room. Uh, the television stand is right there in front of you.
located right now? This is the, the area on the right of the screen is the living room. This is going into the kitchen, and that's the female victim lying on the kitchen floor. Know where this door, that door goes that we were just looking at? That door led out uh, to the side of the house underneath the carport. Is that basically the back door of the residence? Uh, it was a side door. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, the living room would be on your left, the female victim is on the kitchen floor on your right, and this is looking into a small hallway. Um, at the end of the hallway there is a hall closet door. On the left is a, a bedroom, and to the right is another very small hallway where a bathroom and another bedroom are. I believe this is the hall closet door.
this is standing in the hallway on the top right of the screen now is the kitchen this is looking left down the other small hallway at the end of this hallway here is a bathroom the hall closet is on the left in here at the wall there to the right of the side, that a hole or indentation in the sheetrock correct just opposite that is a bedroom door that was forced open This is the bathroom, the only bathroom in the residence. Still in the small hallway, the bathroom that we were just in is on the right. This is the bedroom opposite of the wall with the damage in the hallway. If you're looking down the hallway with the hall closet in front of you, this is the bedroom just to the right of that hall closet. Did this appear to be the kids' bedroom? I believe there were some kids' items in there. It looked like he, that may be where he slept. This is standing in that bedroom looking outside at the hall wall with the damage. This is the closet in that same bedroom.
which room are we looking into? This is the bedroom that's to the left of the hall closet. I believe this is inside that same bedroom, looking out. At the top, you can see the bathroom that we were in earlier. There's bullet holes on the in the walls that had come through the hall closet and into this bedroom. Agent Smithy, I think one of the other things that you had indicated um, that you all did in documenting the scene was to use a 360 camera, is that correct? That's correct. Explain again to the um, jury um, what the 360 camera does and what you all are trying to do with it. So we, we normally take, as you've seen, our video of the scene. We also take still photographs, um, but the 360 camera allows us to navigate through the scene manually. You can zoom in on various things, pieces of evidence. Um, it allows you to move left, right, you know, as, as you need to. Um, and it offers different vantage points and different views as opposed to a video, which is sometimes at eye level and moves at the discretion of the videoer. Um, this allows you to manually move through the scene as you need to. And did you all use that 360 camera in this particular scene? We did. Okay. I may approach your own? Yes. And let me show you, it's been marked by identification now as exhibit number 16. Do you see the red sticker with that on there? I do. Can you tell us what that is. This looks to be the disc of the 360 photographs that we took at the scene. Do you recognize the sleeve that that disc is in? I do. And where does that come from? This comes from the CCBI, from our forensic photographer. And do you recognize um, the markings on that sleeve as, as um, coming from your agency, CCBI? I do. The handwriting is hers, and I recognize her initials. And the disc that's in there, does that appear to contain the um, 360 disc that um, is labeled on the outside there um, for the um, 
360 photographs that were taken of this particular scene. It does. Have you had a chance to review those before coming to court um, today? I have. And in reviewing those, do they fairly and accurately depict the scene that you recall working um, out there in January of 2013 at 708 Colonial Drive? Yes, they do. Have you made any kind of additions, changes, deletions, anything like that, photoshopped it, anything like that from, from when um, this disc was made? No, I have not. Okay. Um, your Honor, I move then to introduce State's Exhibit Number 15 into evidence. I'm sorry, 16. Any objections other than those previously noted on the record? No, Your Honor. Um, the previous objections are noted on the record under the rule and by discretion, I'm going to accept State 16 at this time. And Your Honor, ask that we um, show that to the jury at this time. Uh, you may, and again, this will be offered the same way. Yes, sir. State's exhibit number 16 in the computer that, that is showing on the monitor there. I'm going to open up the general computer icon to open this disk in the DVD drive. Do you see that on the monitor? I do. There are several files or folders. Um, located on here, but um, the one, where would these panoramic images be? Oops. Yes, again. shoot camera that's attached to a specialized tripod. What we do is take photographs at various increments in a 360 rotation. Um, and our forensic photographer uses a special software that's able to map all of the images together, which creates one single image that you can then navigate through. Yeah. And so this file that's marked panoramics actually has all the data and, and a lot of the images that are used to make those Views. Right, that we take numerous single photographs, but when it's mapped together, it's one single image. Okay. And do they appear to be listed on here in these folders as the panorama JPEG files? Yes. Okay, and so I see one that says one panorama. Would that be one of them? Correct. And then it looks like we have a number down. Oops, went the wrong way there. Where are you? There you are. Um, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Let's open the one panorama first. But as, as it first comes up, um, what do you see in, in, in this panoramic view? This is a, a view standing in the front yard area, looking at 708 Colonial Drive on the right of the duplex and 710 is on the left side. Um, it's also showing the driveway, which is on the far right side, and the rest of the front yard on the left side. And as we look at it now, it, it appears to be a still photograph on one screen with all the pictures in this panoramic put together, correct? Correct. So if we... Now, is this, as you indicated, we have the little hand tool, as you see, the cursor has turned into a hand tool? Correct. Can you now then manipulate this however you need to see what view you need? Yes. And I believe it also has a zoom tool here. You can zoom in and out. Right. Okay. All right, so we'll leave it there for the moment. Let's come here so we get oriented. So what are we looking at right here? This is the front door of 708 Colonial Drive. And 
since we went that way, we'll keep going all the way to the left. So we're just going left at 708? Correct. That's the driveway to 708. And that green vehicle there was parked in the front yard when we got there. And that's as far left as it'll, or right as it'll go, right? right? So we'll come back. For the hands out, would this be the driveway for 708 Colonial Drive? Correct. And that's the carport where the side door and kitchen led out to. What are we looking at here? This is the front door of 710 Colonial Drive, the other side of the duplex at this residence. And was there a significance for noting where 710 Colonial Drive is? Yes, there was. What was that? Some of the rounds that were fired inside of 708 went into 710. In, uh, only two different rooms in 710. Road here now. That's yes. Colonial Drive. That's Colonial Drive. Correct. And in which direction are we looking down Colonial Drive here? Um, I'm not sure. That I believe that's west. Do you know would that be the the direction heading towards Old Stage Road? Do you know? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Basically, we're looking straight out from 708 Colonial Drive. Correct. Correct. As it blows up and shows here, basically, it's all the, the views put together for this view. Where is where is this panoramic view going to be? This is inside the living room area at 710 Colonial Drive, next to 708, um, just inside the front door. With the front door of 710 directly behind you looking into the kitchen area. So the floor plans for 708 and 710 were exact, exactly the same, they were just reversed. Like a mirror image of each other? Correct. So when you walk in the front door at 708, the living room feeds to the right. If you walk into the front door at 710, the living room feeds to the left. What do we see here? This is in the living room at 710. The front door would be on my right. Um, this is a bullet hole in the wall of the living room that came from the bedroom on the opposite side. <clears throat> the front door, 710. Correct.
hole in the opposite side from the other bullet hole that we pointed out that would lead came straight through the living room and into this, this far hall. Yeah. The panoramics allow you to, to zoom in on these items, is that correct? Correct. As we did that, did you note something about the shape of that bullet hole when it went to that wall? Yes. What um, was that? It appears that the when a projectile goes through so many items, sometimes it will start to fragment or spin. So it looks like the bullet was spinning when it hit this wall and it hit on its side and put it going straight through. Basically, as you look at all the pictures put together, what's this panoramic video? This is a, a child's bedroom in 710. Um, this bedroom was just on the other side of the living room wall in the previous photographs. In, the, in this panoramic, in this view that we have up on this panoramic. This is the far wall of the bedroom, not the same wall that borders the living room, but the far wall. So on the other side of that bedroom wall would be seven, the bedroom is 708. So this, this wall here, there uh, are two bullet holes in that wall, um, one of which was the ones that came through the opposite wall and then into the living room. Photograph when we move items out of the way on the bottom portion of that wall, bicycles. It's going to be down here somewhere where the cursor is. Correct. One, as you can see, at the top of the screen, and the other, I think, is, is lower on the wall, and you can't see it in these, in these 360. Photographs. Oh, we could document them later on. And I believe there was a third one that I also don't believe shows up in these panoramic videos. Um, I'm sorry, photographs. Um, if you go to the left. Well, it wouldn't let us go anymore. Okay. So let's go all the way around. Okay. There's a closet in that bedroom as well that another bullet hole was found and projectile was found. They won't show up in these, there's no way to get 360 inside that closet, but it does show up later in photographs. Four panoramas. Where are we going to be this time? This is back in 708 uh, in the living room. On the far right, you see the front door.
Yes, this is the front below 708 on the right. Where would the front door be in relation to where we're looking now? Directly behind us. And again, is the wood piece that appeared to be part of the door frame that was knocked off? It was. <laughs> Is that where y'all found that piece of the door frame? It is where we found it when we arrived, yes. Did you all move it there? Uh, we did not. We think that it may have been moved there by EMS and first responders since there were nails protruding from it and they didn't want anybody to step on it, so we think that they moved it out of the way. We're not sure exactly where it was initially. here, basically where is this view going to be? This is standing with the living room directly behind me um, in the entryway of the kitchen, looking into the kitchen, the female victim is seen on the, on the floor there. And this is what the program does, right? I mean, you're trying to Correct. put photographs together? If, if the photographs are off even by, if you bump the tripod accidentally, the photographs will be off just slightly, but that's a normal occurrence in these types of photographs. That hallway we, you were talking about before in the video? Right, the hallway was called in the end. What were you marking with all these markers in that on the hallway floor? Some of them, uh, I believe 32 was an unfired round. The rest of the, the placards are marking shell casings, fire shell casings. The 32 being the one here at the bottom? Correct. That's right at the threshold of the hallway and the kitchen area. itself is in which row? It's in the kitchen. What was this little 
What was this little room um, off of the kitchen? I believe it was a pantry area, but I think it was used more as a storage room. Very small. side door that you were talking about earlier going out to the carport, right? So it comes off of the kitchen? Yes. Of course, the big white thing now that's to our right, what's that? Refrigerator. Where is this panoramic going to be located? This is also in the kitchen. Um, yes, in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So the last panoramic we saw was, uh, I'm also in the kitchen, but as we saw, the refrigerator was right to our right. So it was going to be more in the front part of the kitchen? Uh, more in the back towards the, um, the cabinets. OK, so this panoramic is now towards the back? Correct. That side door, correct? Side door, yes. Okay. Were there holes in this kitchen window over the sink? There were. this hallway kitchen behind us reference point what are we looking at is that that hallway closet at the end that's the hall closet, yes. To the left is the a spare bedroom, uh, or I believe maybe the, the parents' bedroom. Okay, where we are now? Correct. Right. 
kitchen and use the living room there on your the right side. That hole in the wall we were talking about before? Right. The opposite wall of the, the other bedroom. And basically where we're looking into the bathroom. Correct. Where does it end? That is the, on the far far right is the bathroom. Um, this, this entrance right here is to the uh, a bedroom. And to the right side is the bathroom. And is this one of those holes that you had noted where the cursor is? Correct. While you're there, I think you also, or had included on this disc, Copy for you, but do you, do you recognize what we pulled up up here? It's, it's on this disc that's marked state specific number um, 16. And you see there's a, a file number um, at the top of this JPEG file that says 13000295. Is that correct? Correct. All right. and, and what does this show on, on this image? This is the layout of both 708 and 710 Colonial Drive. 708 on the right and 710 on the left. And, and now, is this the, the sketch that you had talked about preparing um, as part of documenting this scene? Not this particular sketch, but yes. Okay, good. And did you, I'm sorry, um, but in creating this, did your agency create this, number one? I believe so. Okay, and do they use the measurements and the, the sketch, the, the handwritten sketch that you um, uh, start out with to try and put this into the computer just, just to make it neater? Yes. All right. Now, just so that we know, as, as far as you know, is this a scale floor plan of, of those two residences? No. Okay. So is it really just more to illustrate um, the different rooms and the layout of the place? Correct. So in, in 708, you have 708 listed up here um, on, on Colonial Drive. Again, does this, as best you recall, generally um, provide the layout of, of that residence that you recall being in working this time? So. Yes, it does. And I think that you all hand wrote on here stick with stick figures where the two different victims were found, correct? Correct. Right. And then 710, you have listed up here again to the left so we know which one that is? Correct, 710. All right. And again, as you look at the general floor plan that's there, you were inside that residence. Does it generally um, uh, show the floor plan of 710 Colonial Drive? Yes, it does. And so, this just the dividing line between them. Was this a shared common wall between 708 and 710? Yes, it was. The um, uh, bedroom, the child's bedroom where the bullets came into in 710, where is that located on this sketch? It's this bedroom here. Okay. And the living room where we ended up seeing um, not only a hole, but also the bullet that had tumbled and actually came in on the side, where is that located? This right here came into this wall in the photograph <clears throat> where the hole was elongated was on this wall here. Um, you also indicated that you took um, several photographs um, 
of, of this particular scene as well to document. Is that correct? Yes. Have you had a chance to review uh, some of those photographs before coming to court today? I have. Do you know altogether how many photographs either you or your agency took out there at the scene at 708 and 710 Colonial Drive? I believe altogether it was about 1,600. Okay. Um, have you, um, first of all, may I approach your honor? Yes, sir. Can I? I'm just, since we have a little time, mm -hmm. I'm just going to lay the foundation as we said. No problem. Let me show you what's been marked by identification now as state exhibit number 17. Do you see that? I do. What is that? It's a disc in a sleeve uh, that's marked photos disc with CCBI case number on it. Do you recognize that CCBI case number? I do. Is it the case number that's associated with this particular case that you've been testifying about? Yes, it is. And have you had a chance to review that disc before coming to court um, today? I have. Does it contain some of the photographs that, that either you or your agency took with respect to the events of this particular case? It does. Now, does it contain all of those photographs that you all took? No, it does not. All right. um, the photographs, though, that are on that disc, do they appear to be um, um, accurate copies of those photographs that you all took at this particular scene? Yes. Do the photographs that you reviewed on this disc, Mark 6, exhibit number 17, do they fairly and accurately depict um, the scene out there at 708 um, Colonial Drive? Yes, they do. And I believe this disc may have different folders for different sets of photographs. Is that correct? Correct. Like, like what kind of other photographs do we have on this disc? There were photographs from a vehicle that was taken, um, other locations um, on Montesino Drive, I believe, okay. other days that we spent at the same scene. Okay. And with the, again, the photographs that, that you were able to, to view um, uh, with respect to where you were involved, do they fairly and accurately depict those scenes that you were at at that particular time? Yes, they do. And particularly the folder that's marked scene on, on state exhibit number 17, do they contain um, numerous photographs of the crime scene here at 708 Colonial Drive? Yes, they do. And do they fairly and accurately depict that scene as you saw it back in January of 2013? Yes, they do. The other um, folders, I think you were involved, were you involved, and we'll talk about that later, with processing a, um, a Dodge Durango motor vehicle? Yes, sir. And did you photograph that vehicle? I did. I believe there are photographs of that um, on state exhibit number 17 as well, is that correct? Correct. Did you, did you have a chance to view those? I did. Again, did they fairly and accurately depict um, that vehicle and that scene when you were processing that vehicle at the time that you were doing it? Yes, they did. Okay. Um, I believe one's a folder um, that's marked first Montesino search or something like that, correct? Right? Correct. Were you present at the time that um, uh, the first searches were done on Montesino Drive in this particular case? Yes, I was. And did you photograph some of the um, items or some of the things that were done uh, back at that time, back on January the 15th, 2013? I believe I photographed items taken from that house, but not at the actual <coughs> scene. Okay. But yes. And, but have you been able to see the photographs under that folder on, on state exhibit number 17? Yes, I have. Are, are they accurate copies of the photographs that you took on, the date, on that date at that time? Yes. And do they fairly and accurately depict those items that you saw um, on the scene at that time? They do. Okay. Thank you. Your, your Honor, at this time, I, I move to introduce state exhibit number 17 into evidence. Any objections? No, Your Honor. Um, Previous objection to the record uh, and overruled in my discretion, I'm going to receive state sentence. This is where I would have started. That's going to take a while. To, so. um, members of the jury, we are this is a good transition or stopping place for us uh, for the weekend. Um, so, what I'm going to do is release you until 10 a.m. Monday. We start at 10 on Mondays. A um, couple things about that. Mondays are the days that we call the calendar that um, other courtrooms will be starting up trials and, uh, and that sort of thing. And typically, we have a lot of jurors coming in on Monday. Uh, so you may have some competition for the parking spaces in the parking deck. Usually by this time of the week, things start winding down, and so it's not as competitive over there. Um, so just factor that in. And also factor in that oftentimes on Mondays, they have heavier in addition to calendar call, the district courts, traffic court, that sort of thing, 
they have heavier calendars oftentimes earlier in the week, so you may encounter a, um, more of a delay or backup at the, um, the security stations coming into the building. So factor that into your uh, travel plans for Monday morning or um, getting here at, uh, on Monday morning. Again, be here at 10 uh, in the jury room, and we will resume where we left off. Um, Please leave your notebooks here in your chair. We'll return those to you Monday morning. It's very important that you uh, continue to follow the rules that I've given to you. Don't talk about this case among yourselves or allow anybody to talk about it in your presence. Uh, you may encounter people this weekend that you don't typically see during the uh, Monday through Friday time frame. Um, and again, when we, uh, you know, people that may know you're on jury duty or may uh, have some idea that you're on your duty and figured out what case it's on. Be very careful about comments that are made, questions that may be asked, and that sort of thing. Um, don't put yourself in a position to solicit that type of information or that type of comment is, I guess, what I'm, I'm going at with this. Um, also, I need to remind you that your verdict, ultimately in this case, must be based exclusively on the evidence that we give you and not from any outside source. So be very careful about exposing yourself to any media accounts. Uh, you're not to conduct any type of independent investigation. That includes going to the scenes or the places that have been uh, described uh, throughout this week. You're also not to conduct any type of independent research on the internet or anywhere else at your disposal. Again, I'm going to give you the jury instructions. I'm going to define for you all the terms um, so there's absolutely no need for you to do any type of independent research or investigation. You cannot have any contact with anybody that's participating in this case, um, and that includes in, this, in session, out of session, and about any type of, um, you know, any type of conversation. So we're not even, even going to acknowledge you if we pass you in the hallway or in the, uh, in the parking lot or anything of that nature. Um, I think that's all of them. You know them, at least I assume you know them by heart now. I hope you do. Um, to the extent possible, put this matter out of your minds. Enjoy the weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday at 10 o'clock. No, Your Honor. Very well. We'll be at recess until 10 a.m. Monday morning. Uh, well, 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 before I do that, I need to um, extend the session um, in order that the matter be over until next week. Um, any other matters on that? No, sir. No. All right. So the court retains jurisdiction on this matter until Monday at 10. We are close at recess 10 o'clock Monday morning. I'll take this. I'll take this.